Oh. Water. Oh, great. Hi, everybody. <laughs> welcome, Dan. Welcome, Jonathan. Uh, what do we think of Joni's words? Listen, she tells it like it is. <laughs> Love Joni. Considerations of a corporation mm -hmm. having nothing to do with <laughs> the artist's output. What do we think about that? You're, you, uh, you both exist in the belly of the beast. Netflix, LVMH. You go first, Dan. Um, well, it's tough because, because, I, well, I, I currently work for Netflix, so that's a full circle moment because they had passed on shits. In fact, all of America, all of the American network streaming services, cable networks passed on Shit's Creek. And we still believed in it. We took it up to Canada, made it with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, funded it ourselves, pieced all the financing together, found a very teeny tiny American network called Pop Network, which was at the time the former TV Guide Network. So it was just actually just a place where you would go to look at what else was on TV. Um, they didn't tell us at the time that most of their, most of their sort of outlets were standard definition. We weren't even in high definition. And I think the show started in like 2016. There was simply no excuse for it. It was in color though. It was in color, fortunately. <laughs> we could barely afford to make it in color. But uh, anyway, so in a, in a way, it's, it's, it, I, I live in this strange place where we went and made something with absolutely no outside opinions. And because the stakes were so low, we were able to really kind of make the show for ourselves. We were lucky enough to be in a situation where CBC in Canada and Pop in, in, the, in the US needed us, which, you know, was, was important, but they never really interfered. And so what we made was quite pure. It was fun, it was, spe it was specific, it was collaborative. It was all of our actors feeling the freedom to, to help and to shape their characters in ways they might not have if this were done any other way. It did not have test audiences. It had no barometer for success, and yet it succeeded. And so for me, to be in the system now, with a, by way of a show that succeeded despite the system, is, a, is an interesting place to be. And I think it's afforded me a level of freedom that I might not have gotten had I, had I done it a different way. But yeah, and I think on the one hand, yeah, it's, it's tough because huge corporations have so many needs. And how can you impose all of those needs onto a creative idea and expect it to shine? Do you recognize this experience, Jonathan? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I think anyone who works for a corporation, it's, um, uh, well, it's a thing, you know? I always think that sometimes I feel like, you know, I work for LVMH, which is words, ultimately, which is run by a very smart man. And I think it's more about the people's influence or, or um, idea of a corporation is what makes a corporation somehow. Does that make sense? I don't know how to put it, but it's sort of like, it's not the, the man at the top, it is everyone's fear of what they want from it that ultimately sanitizes it somehow. But do you think, <laughs> I think there's something that was... I'm trying to choose my words. Um, but, <laughs> Uh, I'll save you. I'll save you. I'll no, save no, no, no. I, I, but I think it's important. I think, it's, I think sometimes, um, you know, when you talk about corporations, this idea of the designer and the corporation notoriously is seen as this idea of pressure and this idea of commercial success. And, and you know, designers have become footballers, nearly, somehow. But I actually, for me, it's sort of, I, I feel like m my approach to the corporation is more kind of, I put the pressure on, not the corporation, because ultimately I want to be able to work as much, I want to be able to work creatively within the, the corporate structure. Does that make sense? But do you think that's because your success is persuasive 
in, in this context, that your success speaks to the corporation. I'm wondering for both of you, um, I feel that you blossomed during the pandemic, during an extraordinary situation where all bets were off. So you got a global television audience, a kind of captive audience, mm -hmm. and you brought Lueve into people's consciousness in a different way. You were able to bring Lueve into people's minds in a very different way from the standard catwalk, you know, catwalk coverage way. You, you, you activated Lueve in, in a completely new way. And, and so it was a moment, a rare moment, where the outsider's sensibility was allowed to move inside. And I come back to my favorite analogy, which is the Trojan horse, <laughs> that you were able to shunt your perverse outsider sensibilities into the mainstream because of this extraordinary circumstance that existed in the world. What do you think of that premise? <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong, I guess. Yeah, I mean, we, again, we had no expectation for the show, and yet people found it, and I think they found it because it was kind of perverse and weird, and, and at first it was this culty thing that people, I think, took some, some pride in having found. And then it became what it was, and it became what it was because of Netflix. And now working with Netflix, and I, I have made a, a film with them now, and they were incredibly supportive through that entire creative process, granted, I was very clear about the boundaries that I'm setting for myself in terms of preserving the actual idea. So I think a lot of it too is, is where you're willing to draw the line in preserving what it is you want to make. And I've, I've come to realize that I think some people, I'm an incredibly fearful person just generally in life, but when it comes to work, I'm not. And I have no problem saying to someone, well, if we can't do it this way, then we won't do it. And we'll find another way, we'll find another idea to do. And that, I think, scares people because they're used to people being indebted to the process instead of owning their own work and saying, okay, well, if this doesn't work, then, then let's not do it. Is that as fundamental as the old creative integrity versus commercial success debate? I guess, I mean, it also, it is predicated on privilege too. I have the ability to do that. You know, I, I don't want to leave out the conversation where a lot of people in, in more vulnerable positions have to take the job. They have to accommodate the idea to make sure that it fits. Or, I mean, I, I guess in life they technically don't, but in a lot of business senses, if you want the paycheck, you have to, you have to bend. Um, so the, the, a, the idea of privilege does enter into the equation. I am at a point in my life where I don't need to do anything I don't want to do. What I have found quite exciting in the challenge is saying, okay, I know that you need this little movie that I've made that's a drama and everyone knows me from comedy. I know that you need this to kind of have mass appeal. You're a business, I get it. So the challenge for me is how do we meet halfway in the marketing of it, in the, in the way that it looks to people and in the outward facing campaign of it? Because if certain people had their way, it would be promoted as a rom-com because that's the easiest way to get people in. And yet, it's not. So I still have to preserve the idea of, of the movie. I have to preserve the experience so that people aren't getting a completely different, you know, you know the door is, is letting them into a different room, so to speak. And yet, it's been a fun challenge because I think where we've landed in the marketing of it, in the, in the promotion of it, has actually, informed me in terms of, okay, there is a way that creativity and uh, the, the, the kind of larger goals of a, of a business can, can come together. If that now, this sense. film is good grief. Yeah. And do you, do you feel that it is, you say the drama and the, the rom-com, there's a drama and rom-com debate there. Um, what, I think would, from a promotional like it, standpoint. They would like it to be rom-com for promotion. Yeah, for well, promotion I, you know, I think they, you know, bright, bright and happy. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's about grief. No, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering, what did you say there? It's about grief. <laughs> it's about grief. Well, well, I understand it's a tough sell. Yeah. You know, you well, need. I, you know, grief, grief, is a, grief is a pretty major sell, I would say, at the moment. It, black black yeah. comedy seems to be a fairly logical response mm -hmm. to the way the world is. But I, I'm wondering uh, for Jonathan, 
the, the notion of the cult that becomes a mainstream success, mm. um, the cult of J.W. Anderson becoming this, I mean, Loewe is now widely touted as one of the most successful brands in the whole, the whole industry. Uh, how, how you face that notion of expectation, that um, you know, massaging expectation, preserving your own sense of what you do when there is this whole other growing uh, notion that's it's swirling around you that you know is happening with Dan as well. I, I don't. I, I kind of. I, I, I kind of enjoy it weirdly because when when I started at Loewe, um, it was tiny. It was a very 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 small brand. I think people may not realize how small it was, and. And it was very tough in the beginning because, you know, you would see all these brands doing like billboards and you couldn't do billboards because there was no budget to do billboards. Um, now I quite enjoy being able to, I, I, I enjoy succumbing to it somehow because it's sort of, I use the same creative approach to it, but on a bigger window ultimately. So, you know, like we, we had Maggie Smith recently in a, in a campaign. Heaven. And I remember, <laughs> Heaven. and I remember being in that meeting, uh, you know, and being, you know, maybe as the brand was getting a lot bigger, and media spend is bigger, it, there was a little bit of confusion in the marketing department of like, where should we still be doing images like this? Celebrities don't like their pictures being taken <laughs> in this way, and and I was very determined that this had to go out. And then you kind of, you trust your logic on it. Even though the, the window is bigger, you kind of are, you kind of morph. I, I feel like that's the geniusness of Loewe somehow, is that it is a shapeshifter. It is not a continual aesthetic. You're morphing as the brand grows. It's nearly like character building. You start off at one thing and then you become a different person. Well, you've definitely created the, the, the feeling that anything is possible. At yeah. You really don't know what is coming next. But it was like the pandemic. You know, I will never forget the arguments that were being had behind the scenes of <laughs> as I was sitting in my house, like, in despair with gin and tonic. Like, it was like, <laughs> um, I'm wondering, and that was like, what to do? And, and I work better in that way. I, I, I work better when there is no option, you know? So for me, my whole thing during that moment was to kind of be like, well, if I'm gonna still have a job at the end of this pandemic, I'm gonna need to like change. I, I'm gonna need to do something because I'm bored. Maybe everything was boring and that's why we're all here. So then, I had to reinvent everything. Like I had to reinvent myself somehow because I had to kind of nearly let go of the idea of myself and sort of say, well, I have no choice. Um, we're gonna do a show in a box. I need to be creative. And, and it was in a weird way, it was like really easy pickings because no one was doing anything. <laughs> like everyone was like, how do we do a show? And then they would like fly people and everyone was in masks and I was like, like, this is just uncomfortable. You know what I mean? It was this moment where I was like, well, how do we just get it into people's, like, it was like nearly like mail or order catalogs. I was like, I'm gonna just like bombard you with like fan mail, you know? I'm just gonna send you as much as I can. But then do you think both of you then kind of got the luxury of doing it your way, in a sense? That's a success at that time. You both now, in, in your environments, have the luxury of doing what you want to do. How much of a weight is that, though? I don't think it's a weight. I, I see it as the greatest gift, in a way. Mm. Because when you go out on a limb and it succeeds, you'll never not have that. And so, yeah. I don't want to speak for Jonathan, but when you walk into a room and you have a, you have a conversation with someone who's trying to disprove something that you yourself have proven, it's a lot easier to say, well, I, I don't know, it, it worked. <laughs> It yeah. worked. Not having a test audience worked. 
uh, you know, not having to run, filter something through a million people, it, it, it worked, it found a way. That's not to say that failure doesn't happen. That's not to say that you won't have yeah. highs and lows. Yeah. But for me, it was always about preserving the integrity of the idea, making sure that you fight for the integrity of the idea from the beginning to the end. <laughs> Because as the person who's creating it, you're the one that has to sleep at night. And I always feel I, I, that's, that's the one thing I protect the most is, is in, in a way, my own head. <laughs> because when I go to sleep, I can't think of something more heartbreaking than starting with an idea that I loved, allowing people to change it to the point where it loses its DNA. Then it goes out into the world and either succeeds or fails and I have to look at that and say, well, that's not me. You can never get that back. Mm -hmm. So the fight to protect that, I think, is so important. And I, I only think that the, that, that the, the success, having, having sort of gone around the system and proven it wrong, only a, sort of is like ammunition to keep going. But, 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 but you, you never reach a point where you say, oh, God, can I do it again? You know, does it, does, it ever, does it ever become that kind of pressure? You said something when we were talking about this <laughs> before about this, which was super smart, you, the, the notion that brilliance can be boring. You know, yeah. if you're good over and over and over again, people are like, oh, here he is again with something brilliant. Yeah, and then they dismiss it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then they dismiss it over and again. I, I felt like, a, you know, I felt like you can't be trapped by that. You, you brought up Bowie. You know, I think you can be consistently major and then people kind of it, it becomes like norm so then they're kind of like oh but she's always going to do something major so that's really boring you know like it's sort of <laughs> have you had a taste of that yet i don't know so, so, sometimes i feel like at the Boy, beginning at the beginning part of the web i was I, I felt like i was screaming in a vacuum i would go into like board meetings i would be like but this is major <laughs> like, we have, we have Stephen Meisel giving his archive. This is, like, insane. And, and it was kind of, it wasn't part of a formula. I, I think this is what I love about the pandemic. It destroyed every formula that there ever was. Because you had the biggest business people in the world turning up to their desk, and every store in the world was shut. There was no money. It was insane. Like, so you couldn't even get in to buy the bag because the doors were closed, do you know what I mean? Countries were like locked down. You know, like, what, it, you know what it also did though? It also, it gave the consumer or the audience the freedom to find what they liked. Yeah. And I think so often we're guided down these paths, you know, especially like movie studios, mm. you know, the, the big movie studios pick far in advance the movies they think are going to succeed. And that's where the money goes. And then the smaller movies, the other movies kind of slipped through the cracks. The pandemic. That was the same in fashion. Forced people to figure out what they actually like. And then does it leave you in this position of influence in a way? And how does that feel? Does that become like a, a sort of stress? Like, we didn't plan for this, and now we're here, and look, look the, what's happening. The weirdest we're, we're huge. The weirdest part of it was going into the pandemic, being able to kind of walk down the street and have a life, and then two years pass, and then you walk out of your home and everyone knows who you are. That shouldn't, it shouldn't work like that. You kind of, I feel like you should, you should want that in a way. Like I think people who have notoriety in, in, you know, kind of pursue it. Our show, our cast of our show, we didn't pursue it. We didn't even know it was happening until we walked outside and the world was completely different. I'm grateful for it. It's, it's afforded me a lot of opportunity. I got to meet Jonathan in the process of the pandemic. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was this, yeah, it's a very strange thing. I don't feel pressure by it, but I, I, feel, I actually feel very inspired by it. So what's next? Well, I have a movie that uh, I made that's coming out <laughs> on January 5th. Um, and it was a huge departure. Again, I think we're talking about keeping things interesting. Entertainment has this unbelievable capacity to kind of be like, oh, you did something funny? You're a comic forever. Yeah. And I never wanted to be that. We had always, in the writer's room, had always seen Schitt's Creek as a drama. That's We've what always I mean, written that's it as what a I drama. mean about the tyranny of expectation. Yeah. yeah, so for me, drama was, was what we were writing. It just happened to be funny. 
In this case, I just wanted to continue to tell a, a, a dramatic story that wasn't quite as funny. Moments of lightness, sure. But the idea that I felt compelled or pushed to go to make another Schitt's Creek was so uninteresting to me. And I absolutely will return to comedy in a larger sense, but this was what was interesting to me. This is what was going to keep me excited. And so I did it. And I was very fortunate that Netflix understood that desire and, and backed it. And Good Grief is intensely personal. That's how it felt to me anyway. Yeah, yeah. You've managed to make Loewe a super personal thing as well. Maggie Smith is in the ads and all the other cast of thousands who show up in your ads, a kind of perverse <laughs> mix choice. <laughs> um, how, how do you feel about what's, I mean, what do you see as next for you? When, when, well, you, when I, you're able to do anything, it's very, it's very, it is very difficult. Like with Loewe, I feel, I don't own Loewe, but I feel like I own it. Like, which is probably a bad thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you give everything, ultimately. You have to. I think for something to be successful, you have to give everything you have. Mm -hmm. Because if you kind of go into this sort of thing, well, I'm going to give this little bit to them, but not this, you end up with this half-cooked <laughs> thing. And I don't know, I, I feel, what do I do next? I, I, I want Loewe to continue growing. I think I have financial goals for Loewe. I would like to be able to say, well, we were here, no one saw us coming and this happened. It is better to be- 20 the, billion Loewe. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I do feel we could be, maybe I'm a dreamer, but I do feel like we're entering a period within luxury that is a very different period now. I, I think it is about product. If you cannot, I, I think it's about control and product. I think this is what people haven't realized, is that if you do not, if, if you do not decide the doorknob, how do you sell the bag? Do, do you know what I mean? Because ultimately you've got to sell the journey. And why? Why did I choose that doorknob? Why did we choose this bag? Why do we choose the casting? And I think, I think people are scared of control. Big corporations are scared of control. And I think... Or it's ceding control to somebody like you. Or to anyone. Because it's, it's never be, there has never been a history of the logic of that. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's why I think we had Dan get on. Because, you know, I, 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 for me, I like Dan because it's 360. I think 360. I want my team to think 360 on what we're putting out there. And sometimes you have to make the decision that you may have to give the audience what they don't want to annoy them. <laughs> because there's nothing better when people are annoyed because then they think. Um, and I think, I always think that when I'm doing a collection, how do you, how do you kind of uh, go off the path that you're on? You know, it was like I was in a kind of orgy of surrealism at one point. It was ridiculous. You know, we had I cars. Loved it. it was a great moment. Great. But then it was quite nice to then suddenly be like, we are not going to do that. And we are going to just be about a one silhouette show. You know, because ultimately you are changing up the chapter of the book. You know, because I think the minute you fall into a formula, and I think we've seen this in brands, the minute a brand becomes formularic, the clock starts ticking. And, and this is, I think, in everything. It's like TV series, it's like, if, you know, it's like The Crown. Um, <laughs> the clock is really ticking and it's ticked way over time here. <laughs> and you were talking about annoying the audience, so I'm gonna annoy the audience by saying that's all the time we've got. Oh no! <laughs> Look at that big, oh! Uh, we could really talk for another 45 minutes, <laughs> as we have. Um, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very thank much, you. Dan. Thank you.